So today I want to talk about direct solvers. So the problem is really just to uh, nicely and quickly solve a system of linear equations a, a, a x equals b where let's say that a is a square matrix, b is some right hand side. Last time we started talking a little bit about um, numerical linear algebra, right? And I told you don't implement this yourself, use an existing software. The grandfather of all these things is BLAST, the basic linear algebra subroutines. <clears throat> and this comes in three levels. There is, you might hear these things like level one, level two, and level th three, BLAST, okay? These levels are roughly correspond to the asymptotic time complexity. So those are like ON operations. For example, a mat scalar mat a matrix, matrix scale, sorry, scalar vector product or adding two vectors, okay? Those are linear time operations. That would be BLAST level one, okay? BLAST level two are in general ON squared um, uh, operations such as matrix vector product, okay? And level three <clears throat> are n cubed operations such as matrix matrix multiplication. Okay, and this thing has been around since like late 70s, and since the 80s, the DeBlas is kind of like the standard API. And if you go go to it, it's like naming conventions and everything. It also supports um, not just floats and doubles, but also complex numbers. <clears throat> and it's kind of <clears throat> the, the grandfather of all modern. Uh, of, of the modern uh, algebra subroutines. Uh, the API is standard, but there is many different implementations, okay? There are free implementations out there. There are some vendor-specific implementations like the in Intel MKL implements the routines, optimized probably for their processors, right? But the API is the same, which is kind of nice because you can you can swap them, <clears throat> and if your code uses the standard BLAST API, it, it still works. Now, this is still being used, the BLAS. You will, you will still, if you read documentations of things, you will hear things about BLAS, so that, that's, why I'm, that's why I'm mentioning it. Uh, but <clears throat> today there are more modern libraries. What most people in graphics are using is the Eigen library, okay? That's a free, uh, I guess most of you are using it in your projects too, right? That's a free library which has its own BLAS implementation, which is actually pretty good. Or alternatively, you can link it to other BLASs too, like to the Intel MKL BLAS, which can be sometimes a little bit more performant, especially on Intel CPUs, I guess. But again, also these original BLAS routines were done like in Fortran, and actually if you go through the numerical code, there is still a bunch of stuff in Fortran because it works and nobody ever changed it. The Eigen is a C++ template library, so that's that's really modern thing. And also has some more modern like linear algebra features. It has like a built-in support for sparse vectors and matrices, which is something you will want to use. That we will we will get to that in, in this in this lecture in a, in a moment. Okay. The main point is whatever you want to use, just use some existing library. Uh, even for um, silly things like matrix matrix product, right? If, if, if you have a, so let's say I have another matrix B, right? And it's also N by N. If you just want to compute the product A times B, this, it doesn't strike you as something that would be like difficult to code, right? Everyone, every single one of you would be able to code up a matrix matrix product in like five minutes in your favorite language, right? It's basically just like, uh, two, two, two four cycles, right? Take, an, uh, take, take a row from matrix A, column from matrix J, dot product, that's, that's one, that's the output, right? So it's like three, four lines of code in whatever language you want. Now I promise if you just write this in C, then your code is definitely gonna work, but it's gonna be suboptimal by a factor of 10 to 100 compared to a hardware optimized BLASTIS, okay? either a BLAS or, or Eigen. So if you are writing this by yourself, um, you are leaving on the table performance factor of about 10 to 100, okay? And that's because these optimized routines, they take very careful use of the hardware, okay? There is the there is a stack of caches, right? We talked last time about the main problem being the memory is slow compared to the compute, right? You can do about 20, 30, 40 arithmetic operations per one read of a floating point number from the memory. And there is also a hierarchy of caches, right? You have heard about L1, L2 cache, and so on. And these modern blasts, they are optimized for exactly this. There's also vector instructions, right? You have heard of SIMD, SSC, AVX, that's on modern CPUs. 
and it gets even more funny when, when you start thinking about GPU because that's even a different architecture. But let's let's not go there. Even on the CPU, it's very important to use an existing implementation. Even for something you wouldn't really think like needs an exist needs an extra library because there's always an overhead with an extra library, right? But in this case, you want to use an ex external library because it will be faster than your code, unless uh, hardware architecture specific optimizations is your hobby, in which case feel free to write it yourselves. So another thing there is. Um, so this is just like for your information, right? One thing that is actionable for you is exploiting structure, okay? So that's on a different level than this kind of blast stuff, which was about exploiting the hardware, the computers we got, okay? And using them in a smart way. Now this is about exploiting the linear algebra properties in a smart way, okay? The point is the same. You, you want your linear algebra and ultimately your solvers and numerical integration to run fast. Uh, and this is a different way to get there. So what do I mean by exploiting structure? So for example, let's talk about just the matrix vector product, okay? MATLAB product. <clears throat> so if the matrix is n by n, you can immediately tell me what is the time complexity, right? What is the number of flops this will take? What is the number of flops? Yeah, uh, just, uh, sorry, I guess, Flops is kind of <laughs> what I mean, the number of floating point of, or let's say number of arithmetic operations to compute the matrix vector product. So X is an n-dimensional vector. That, that's super easy. N squared. Yeah, so that's N squared floating point operations. I don't, I don't mean the per second here. That's oh, just okay. like the total. <laughs> So, and the structure, the, the most common structure you will encounter when dealing with like problems in FIS based is that when A is sparse, okay? Sparse means, uh, the definition of a sparse matrix means that it has sufficiently enough zeros that it uh, makes sense to uh, take advantage of it, okay? So sparse means that it has certain only a certain number of non-zeros. So let's say that M is the number of non-zero elements and N and Z, okay? So basically, uh, you can imagine that the matrix has almost everywhere zeros except that for a few non-zeros, okay? That's, that's the case when you would like to exploit sparsity, okay? So if A is sparse, how fast can the matrix vector product be? What is the complexity? What is the number of arithmetic operations you need to execute roughly? You know that the scalar, the factor doesn't matter if it's like, maybe this would be like two times, right? Because there is some multiplication and pluses. This doesn't matter, okay? The constant in, in front of it. Like sometimes, sometimes computer science people like to write this capital O, but then like even ugly constants can hide into the capital O, so then. <laughs> So what is the complexity if the matrix is sparse and only has M non-zeros? So it's still N by N, okay, but now, now the idea is that there is a bunch of zeros in, in the matrix. Almost everywhere are zeros, for except for a few elements that are non-zeros, and there is M of them. Well, M cannot be less, or M, M probably won't be less than n, but it probably will be much less than n squared, right? That's kind of what I meant, that it makes sense to take advantage of the sparsity. If you have just like a couple of zeros in the matrix, and just screw that and say it's, it's dense, okay? Because dense matrix, like like here, definitely can have zeros in it too, right? But here we are optim so we are exploiting the structure, we are exploiting the sparse structure of the matrix to get faster linear algebra. So let okay, imagine it's a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix, okay, so 100 million elements, okay, and let's just say that M is like 100,000, that on average every row has only 10 non-zeros. Okay, so what is the complexity here of the matrix vector product with a sparse matrix? Well, that's uh, O of M, right? Because you can you can store the matrix in a way that you skip the zeros. So you are not storing the zeros. You will just store the non-zeros, okay? And there are different types of formats. That the easiest one you can think about is just the triplet, right? I, J, and the value there. <clears throat> Turns out this format is actually not the best for numerical computations. So you might hear things like, 
compressed row storage or compressed column storage, CRS, CCS. Those are just data structures, how to store efficiently the non-zeros in the matrix, okay? Uh, whatever way you do it, you can write the matrix vector product with a sparse matrix so it only takes M operations, okay? So if the M was 100,000 compared to 100 million, huge advantage, okay? This is something you cannot afford to ignore. This is not like a subtle, this is even more than like this BLAS versus your C, C code. It was like on the order of 10 to 100, also something you cannot ignore, but here it's even more, okay? <clears throat> Another fun type of structure is if A is low rank, okay? What do I mean by low rank? That means that I can factor A as UV transpose, where U is an N by D matrix, sorry, n by d matrix and v is also an n by d matrix let's make it simple n by d matrix okay where this d is something very small much smaller than n okay in the extreme case it can be one okay when the a is just an outer outer product of two column vectors u and v okay so this means that the matrix a has rank d okay <clears throat> is everybody on board with the linear algebra stuff, rank of a matrix. It's the number of non non zero uh, eigenvalues in the matrix. Okay, so here here it here it's obviously the D. Because like graphically this this A is a square matrix, right? And the U and V are matrices uh, that look like this. Uh, they are tall and skinny matrices. When I transpose the V, it looks like this. So this is like a like essentially a sum of individual outer products. So if I want to do, uh, now I know I tell you that A is low rank and I tell you what the U and V T is and I want to compute this. So that is equivalent to computing that. How fast you can implement that? What, what uh, number of uh, arithmetic operations you will need there? So clearly you could just say, well, I can just do it the same way as here, right? I can just multiply this out or, or not even decompose it and just, just do this, right? But as you can guess, that's probably highly suboptimal. You can actually get it much better, much faster if you know the matrix has this low rank structure and you know what the dec decomposition is. So, yeah, anybody is in favor? Hmm? Correct. And how do you do it? to get ND algorithm. Sorry, I can't hear. Right, right. So uh, algebraically, we can say this as using matrix associativity, okay? Because this is the same thing as doing it that way, right? Matrix multiplication is associative, okay? And aha, uh -huh, now, now, now that's great, right? Because the VT is just an N by D matrix. So this is gonna be ND operations, and this, this second, and that gives me a vector, right? And the second multiplication is also just ND, okay? So this way I get I get the result in like two ND arithmetic operations. The two doesn't matter, so asymptotically it is just ND. If D is one, that means that you have sped up the algorithm again insanely. Okay, imagine that N is ten thousand and D is one, or D is ten, right? Still huge savings. Okay. So this is why exploiting sparsity is, is a big deal because whenever you can exploit the, the sparsity, or sorry, exploiting structure and sparsity or low rank are examples of structure, okay? There is also trickier examples of structure. You can have a matrix which is like a combination. You can have sparse plus low rank. Uh, you know what's the funny difference between these two? The sparsity is easy to discover. You can basically just look at your matrix and see how many non-zeros it has. Discovering the low rank structure basically cannot be done in a reasonable way. You need to know it ahead of time from like the construction of your, from where the matrix came from. Because you could do, you could do eigen decomposition, but eigen decomposition is n cubed. So by the time you are done with your eigen decomposition, you might have as well done, done, done it the stupid way, okay? <clears throat> 
So you, this low rank kind of you need to know a, a priori. And same thing if it's just if it's a sum of sparse and low rank, then you can play some little more uh, advanced tricks. But you can also speed things up uh, insanely, just like in these other two cases. It's even hard to uh, discover this structure. Uh, typically, what you will see is diagonal plus low rank. It's an interesting case, which actually sometimes uh, sometimes uh, comes up in practice. All right, so uh, let's uh, talk about direct solvers. So that's essentially an algebraic way for solving a system of equations ax equals b. Okay, and we will assume that a is a nice square matrix. Let's not assume it's symmetric for now. Let's just be uh, general. And the direct solvers, basically that's an algebraic approach and the way algebra works, it kind of decomposes the hard problem into uh, many small, easier sub-problems, okay? It's kind of philosophically different from the iterative solvers, which is the other family of methods, how to solve exactly the same problem. Because the iterative solvers, they kind of improve the solution a little bit, okay? So it's a different kind of philosophy here. So uh, the algebra, uh, the, probably the best way to explain this is to start from easy cases, okay? So let's talk about first easy case when A is diagonal. So everybody can solve this, AX equals B for X when A is diagonal. I hope so. How do you do it? And, and what is the complexity? You just divide, so it's a diagonal, right? So it's just a dividing by the diagonal elements, dividing each of the components of B by each of the diagonal elements. It's so simple, I don't even write, write it there unless you want me to. And the complexity, of course, will be linear, right? So this is trivial if A is diagonal. Slightly more um, complicated but still very easy case is if A is upper or lower triangle. So what do I mean by triangle? If you look at the matrix, it's a square matrix, right? So here would be the diagonal. And if it's a lower triangle matrix, it means here I have zeros and here there, there are some, some, some values over here, okay? If it's upper triangle, that means I have some stuff, some numbers over here and zero over there, okay? Can everybody solve uh, this system of linear equations with A's either upper or lower triangle? Kind of doesn't matter which it is. How do you do that? Do you know? Do you know it? Okay, so let's try to let's try quickly write it out. So let's say it's a lower triangle. So my system looks like this: a11, x1, and the rest is zeros, and this equals b1. Then I have a21, x1 plus a22, x2 equals b2. Then I have A31X1 plus A32X2 plus A33X3 equals B3, okay? I, I, could, I could keep going like this, okay? This is the lower triangle matrix, the, a, a, the A's, right? These are the elements of the matrix. So is it now clear how to solve it? So you first solve for X1, right? So this, this tells me that X1 equals B1 divided by A11. If the A11 is zero, no solution, okay? You can, you can report an error. Now I know what X1 is, so I can plug this thing in here and solve for X2 from here, okay? So from here I will have X2 equals B2 minus A21 times X1, which is B1 divided by A11. Right, and the whole thing gets divided by A22, okay? So this uh, process is called forward substitution. And for the, um, okay, so that's a forward slash backward substitution. If this was an upper triangle, then it's the backward substitution because the idea is exactly the same except that you start from the bottom, right? You always start from the equation where you can immediately compute the unknown and then keep going. What is the complexity of this operation of either forward or backward substitution in terms of arithmetic operations? How many operations do you need to do up to up to a constant? It should be, it should be a 
Yes, correct, n squared. We probably like uh, like something like half of n squared, right? But the constants don't don't really matter because it's only like a one triangle. <laughs> but the point is that it that is n squared. Yes. Another important easy case for A is a permutation matrix. Did we have the discussion what are permutation matrices? I guess we did not. Okay, so permutation matrix, it's a very easy case of a matrix. Uh, it, the matrix basically looks like this. Aij is either one or zero, and it's one if the column index is the permutation of I, okay? Where the permutation is, is a bijective mapping between a set of numbers 1, 2, 2, n to itself, 1, 2, 2, n, okay? A permutation. So uh, another way to look at it, it's an orthonormal matrix, which has only zeros and ones in it, and there is exactly one one element at every row and column. Okay, so let me give you an example, a three by three permutation. This would be an example of a three by three permutation matrix. Okay, it's kind of like the, what is the chess piece on the chess board that kind of must be in this kind of configuration? So they are not attacking each other. Rook or power? I'm blanking on the English word. Oh, rook? Yeah, so it's like a configuration of rooks on a chessboard, so they are not uh, threatening each other. So this is an example of a permutation matrix as a special type of orthonormal matrices. Okay, it, it is it is orthonormal, which is kind of trivial because you could dot product of every of any two columns, you get zero if they are different, and you get one if it's the same column. Okay, so clearly, how how do we solve a x equals b if you know that a is a permutation matrix? Well, you know it's orthonormal, right? So the inverse is just transposition. So we solve it simply by applying A transpose B. Transposition is nothing. Then it kind of boils down to the efficient hardware implementation. From a, from a math perspective, it's trivial. So those are the trivial cases. Those are easy to solve, okay? And then the idea of direct solvers, the algebraic approach, is that if we have a general A matrix, so if we have a general A, then um, we factor it into a product of simple matrices, okay? Sometimes it's called a factor-solve approach. Factor-solve, okay? So what I mean by, so the factor means that I break down the A matrix into a multiplication, this is a matrix multiplication I'm writing right now, multiplication of simple matrices, okay? Specifically these, diagonal, upper lower triangle, permutation, okay? And then once I've broken it down like this, then, then the solve, let me write it like this, the solve will be like A inverse B, okay? I assume the matrix is invertible, otherwise the solve wouldn't, wouldn't really work and we'd just be reporting an error, but that's not my point right now. So you can write it like this. You can write it as AK inverse, then would be AK minus one inverse, and so on up to A2 inverse, A1 inverse uh, times B, okay? And the key thing is, again, the, the way you compute these um, products, and the way is, is like this, okay? So you start computing A1 inverse B, then you do A2 inverse this, here is a good moment to mention to, to make a note. Whenever I write this A inverse B, I never mean go ahead and compute the inverse and then do a matrix vector product. Okay, that's one of I guess one of the basic things of numerical linear algebra. Never form the almost you almost never want to form the inverse explicitly. Okay, because what and that kind of the contract is that even if I write it like this, that doesn't mean you compute it like this, okay? Even here, when I write A, A1 inverse B, when I assume that A1 is one of these simpler, simple cases, okay? What I actually mean by the A1 inverse B is that you do this, that you do a linear system solve of A1 x1 equals B, okay? That's what I mean when I write A1 inverse B, okay? Well then, guess what? Then you do the A2 inverse this, Okay, which where this is x1, okay? So then you do a2 x2 equals x1, okay? 
uh, by the way, this nicely corresponds, this, these inverses, cores, that, that corresponds to the MATLAB notation where MATLAB would say A backslash uh, B. Okay, and that, that means exactly this, or in this case, A1, I guess, backslash B, if, if, if this was to be equivalent to, to this thing. <laughs> And then you could have a2 backslash the a1 backslash b, so that would be the MATLAB notation for this, if you are familiar with MATLAB. If not, it doesn't matter. Uh, so you do this, and uh, at the end you are at the ak, that's the last one, right? So you are computing the ak inverse times your x, and that equals the xk minus 1, okay? So the way it works is that this is the one you solve first, okay? If A1 is one of these simple cases, then this solve for X1 is simple, okay? Then you got X1, and voila, it, 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 it goes to the right-hand side of the next problem, okay? So now you are solving for X2, given that you already computed what X1 is, okay? And so on. And at the last step, you already have XK minus 1, so it becomes the right-hand side, and you solve for X. And this x is the solution of the original problem, ax equals b. So that's the general recipe how this works. And already here it's actually, there, there, is, a, there is an interesting uh, thing for you to remember from this lecture, is that uh, if you succeeded in doing this factorization in some of these simple matrices, then the solve is going to be fast. Okay, because each of these steps are fast, and in sequence of fast steps, the k is never too big. It's usually like three or even two. Okay, so the sequence of several fast steps is fast. The bottleneck almost always is the factorization. Okay, so how to, and that's what the, the rest of the lecture will be about, how to actually accomplish this, right? How to break a com uh, general or complicated matrix into simple ones. That's the bottleneck. Now, one thing already, without even knowing how the factorization works, uh, you can immediately have one actionable thing or one thing that will help you in practical implementations. What if I have multiple right-hand sides? And that actually sometimes happens in a FIS-based. Multiple right-hand sides. What I mean is that you have to solve these two systems of linear equations, okay? I have two right-hand sides, B1 and B2. The A matrix is the same in both cases, okay? Well, the straightforward way would be to just solve it one by one, right? Like in MATLAB notation, you would write this. And so that would be your X1, and then your X2 would be A backslash B2, right? That would totally work. That would give you the solution. It would use, the MATLAB uses all this optimized stuff and the blast things and all, all these clever things, right? So it does that pretty quickly. If the A is a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix, like we discussed in the example last time, then computing, computing this takes roughly 20 seconds on, on my laptop in MATLAB. Okay, so clearly if you are computing this twice, then it takes 40 seconds, okay? Now guess, guess how fast is if you do it like this in, in MATLAB notation? How long does this take? So that's computing exactly the same thing. It's just a different way in, in MATLAB of writing this. This is just telling MATLAB, hey, I have two right-hand sides, okay? As opposed to saying, hey, I have right-hand side B1, then, then get a result. And, oh, oh, by the way, I also have B2 and get, get a result, okay? Then I just sequentially run the two things. Obviously, it's twice the cost, right? Do you, do you guess how fast is this if you run that in, in MATLAB? You can try it, by the way, if you have a MATLAB one. You can try it, like, right now. <laughs> That's, that's surprising, actually. The cost is 20 seconds. So the overhead for the second right-hand side is almost zero. Do you know what happened there? Why, why, was it, why was this twice as fast than this? Yes, you're right. The, but the concatenation is not critical. The, the critical thing is it's one solve. So what happened there is it's using exactly this factor solve approach. Okay. 
now I'm talking about a general dense matrix, so not, not talking about exploiting any structure. By the way, if there was structure, if this was sparse, this would be way, way faster than 10 It could be 1,000 times faster easily, okay? So this is, I just generated a random matrix, dense, and just called it dense uh, uh, MATLAB routine, so, so nothing fancy at all. But even in, in this simple dense case, what happens? Well, the MATLAB first has to factor, factorize it, okay? The factorization is essentially a version of Gaussian elimination, and that is cubic complexity. So that's, that's uh, n cubed. So in, if it's 10,000, that's uh, 10 to 12 uh, arithmetic operations, okay? The solve then, those are just two uh, triangular matrices. So the uh, solve is uh, quadratic complexity. That means the solve is completely negligible compared to the cost of the factorization, okay? So what happened, if, if you gave it like this to MATLAB, it factorized once. And then did so did one factor step and two solve steps. The second solve step you didn't even notice because it's so fast it didn't matter compared to the cost of the factorization. Okay, but you have to be you have to be clever about it. Okay, and that's that's kind of why I'm, why I'm saying this because the the the, naive, the obvious way would be to do it like this. In which case, MATLAB doesn't know that it should reuse the factorization. Okay, so you need to like actively. Uh, know about this and and to reuse the pre-computed factorization does that make sense and this by the way this uh this multiple right hand sides business that you can do additional right hand sides for essentially no overhead that's uh, one of the main advantages of direct solvers compared to iterative methods all right so let's so is that is that clear any questions on this if that's okay, then we can move on to the factorization, okay? That's the remaining and that's the hard part there. And also the slow part, right, in most cases. This is how do we break down the matrix into a product of simpler matrices, okay? So the simplest case or the most uh, common case is LU factorization, <coughs> which is essentially nothing but a matrix version of Gaussian elimination. Okay, and there is uh, an, importing, uh, an important trick there, which is called pivoting, uh, which has to do with round of errors, okay? All these things we, we are talking about, all these blasts and eigens and, and, and all that, that computes in floating point arithmetics, either floats or doubles on pretty much all the, all the processes that are out there, okay? And all of them make small rounding errors in each of the arithmetic computations, okay? In, in floats, it's on the order of roughly 10 to minus 8. In doubles, it's roughly on the order of 10 to minus 16, okay? So they are tiny, tiny errors. It's kind of like a calculator, right? The, you cannot really represent an arbitrary real number. You need to cut it off somewhere. And the standard, which is in the hardware in, in most uh, processors, is the IEEE float and double standard, which you can read in excruciating detail how exactly it works. The main idea is that it kind of has, has uh, some... Uh, it has some number which is less than one, and then it then it represents this exponent, okay? So you can easily do something in like 0 0.58, 1, times 10 to 23. So it represents this exponent 23, so you can go to really large numbers or really tiny numbers really easily. But here in this, I think it's called Mantissa, you only have a limited precision. This is, by the way, not 10. This is actually binary. And there are some special cases for NANDs and so on. And that, that's how it gets hairy. But the main idea, it, rep it captures, it represents in a certain number of bits the exponent and the Mantissa, okay? But this is not important. What's important is that there is rounding error. Every time you do a simple arithmetic operation, you are making a tiny error, okay? It turns out that if you do Gaussian elimination naively, this, these errors can completely destroy the result, okay? So you can get a completely wrong answer. Let me give you an example of this. why this actually matters, okay? So let's assume we have like a simplified computer that we have only like three digits of decimal precision. Okay, 
okay? Just to simplify the arguments a little bit, could easily change it um, for like float or doubles. And let's say that we have a system of two equations, let me call them A1 and A2. So the A1 will be minus 10 to minus four, x plus y equals one, and the other one will be x plus y equals two. Okay, you can probably guess why I put the minus four there, because that's what, that's what gets lost in the three digits of precision, okay? Now the solution in exact arithmetics, the exact solution is this. The exact solution is one over 1.0001, and the y, the exact y is 1.0002, divided by 1.001, okay? So basically the solution is after after rounding, right, in, in two, two, three digits, the x is approximately one and the y is also approximately one, okay? You can, you can plug it in here, right? This gets multiplied by something really tiny, so yeah, this is approximately satisfied, this is um, also satisfied, okay? So that's the exact solution. Now let's look what Gaussian elimination will do. if you run in the standard or in the, in the straight, straightforward way. So how does Gaussian elimination work? So I need to eliminate this x from the A2 equation, right? So what I do, uh, this, this, this first element is sometimes called the pivot, okay? So I multiply by the inverse of the pivot uh, and add it to the second equation. So what that means um, that I, multi I do 10 times four times A1, and I add it to the equation A2, okay? So that if after I multiply this by 10 to four, then the axis disappear, and I will, here I will get 10 to four plus one y, and the right-hand side is going to be uh, 10 to four plus two, okay? I took A1, multiplied by 10 to four, added it to equation A2. That's how Gaussian elimination works, okay? So now I have this, I have 10 to 4 plus 1 times y equals 10 to 4 plus 2. All right, so now the rounding kicks in, okay, because this is this is 10,000, I have only three digits of decimal precision. So this, this gets rounded to uh, 10 to 4 y equals 10 to 4, okay, this, this, this 1 and 2 disappear. Uh, so from this, and this is by the way fine, right? The exponent is still representable, that, that's, that's, that's okay. So from this, I of course compute that y is one, okay? So far so good, okay? We made some tiny rounding error here and we got a slightly wrong answer, but it's still kind of kind of okay, right? The y is one, it's approximately um, equal to the correct y. It's kind of as good as we can expect given that we have only three digits of precision, okay? But here is when the problem happens. So now I take this y, now Gaussian elimination continues, right? What do I do next? I have this y computed from the second equation and I plug it into A1, okay? So what happens, let me write it out. So I take A1, so I take uh, 10, minus 10 to minus four times x plus y. Y is one, that's what I just computed, equals one. Okay, so that's A1 with this one substituted in there. Well, from this, I have to conclude that x is zero. Okay, because one minus one is zero, I multiply by 10 to four, still zero, okay? And that's a disaster because this is not even remotely close to the right solution. The right solution is roughly one, okay? If you, if you, if you plug it in there, you, you see that the equation A2 is not satisfied even approximately, right? You do one plus zero is not two, okay? So you got completely wrong answer. So, uh, Let's, let's analyze this. Why, why, why did it fail so bad? What, why did we get such a terrible x? Especially as we don't have that bad y, okay? The y, so here is what happened. The y has a little bit of rounding error in it, okay? The y should have been this, but instead we got one because of rounding, okay? Fine, so far so good. The problem happened here, okay? This one should not have been one. That, that should have been one plus some, something tiny. Okay, that means that this, this thing, so when we were computing this, when we had this um, minus 10 to minus four x equals zero, that means this zero shouldn't have really been zero. It had actually some tiny uh, decimal digits some, somewhere far, far below. When we kind of killed it, it was by multiplying this by 10 to four, okay? Because the 10 to four 
amplified this tiny numerical error by a lot, and that's why we ended up getting entirely wrong x. <clears throat> Fortunately, the solution to this is easy. The solution is pivoting, or to be more accurate, partial pivoting, because then there is other type of pivoting, but let's just talk about the the basic solution. So uh, it's actually very simple. All you need to do is to actually flip the equation. So I'll call them B1 and it will be the, the one what used to be A2. So I'll just do this one first and then I'll put B2 and that will be the second one minus 10 to minus 4. Still exactly the same equations, exactly the same numbers, just in a different order. And it turns out if I do the computations in a different order, then actually everything is fine. Let's do that uh, Quickly, okay. So how Gaussian elimination would proceed? Well, um, it looks like that I would multiply B1, so I'd take 10 to minus 4 times B1 and add it to B2, right? So if I do that, then the x disappears. That's kind of why I'm doing it. That's the elimination, right? And then I have uh, 10 to minus 4 plus 1y equals 2 times 10 to minus 4 uh, plus one. I didn't make a mistake. Right? So this thing gets um, correct. So this thing gets rounded off to so this at least 10 to minus fours are below the resolution of your decimal precision, if you will. So this gets rounded to just y equals one. Okay? By the way, same same thing that happened here, okay? So this this y is fine. There is a tiny numerical error in it, but it's tiny, so it doesn't bother us, okay? Now, the important thing happens, now, now I take this uh, y, the y equals 1, and I plug it back into the first equation, into b1, okay? And then guess what happens? Then I have x plus 1 equals 2, and everything is cool, right? Because what I, what I get is x equals 1, and hey, that's a pretty good approximation of what the x should have been, okay? So that's, that's the solution of this problem that's called partial pivoting and the trick is to always put uh, always eliminate using the equation that has the highest pivot in absolute value the pivot is this leading coefficient here the problem here was that this guy this guy here the 10 to minus 4 was tiny 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 thing you actually want large pivots there if you do this turns out the algorithm is numerically stable and these these kind of numerical disasters are avoided by the way, do you know who figured this out? Uh, this pivoted LUD composition? It's the same guy who cracked the German uh, code in World War II, Alan Turing. It's just kind of like now, now it's kind of simple hack and every computer science student could do it, but back then there was no computer science, right? Turing is kind of the grandfather of computer science, so that kind of required a little bit of genius to figure these things out. <laughs> without any real computers. All right, so the Turing stuff or this partial pivoting can be summarized in a theorem, which says this. If I have A, which is, let's say it's square and non-singular, meaning it's, it's invertible. Uh, so can be factored as follows. A equals P L U, where um, the P is a permutation matrix, L is lower triangle, and U is upper triangle. I won't go into details. I used to teach it in my linear algebra class. That takes takes a little bit a uh, little bit of time. But basically, it's just a matrix version of Gaussian elimination. <clears throat> this P, the permutation matrix, by the way, that's that's uh, that's the pivoting bit there. It's necessary even uh, theoretically for for existence. Okay, even if you are a mathematician and you have infinite precision, so you don't worry about running errors, you still need this P. Why? Because this 10 to minus 4 could have been 0, okay? Then you cannot possibly eliminate it even if you have infinite precision, 
okay? Then you still need to flip the equations. That's exactly what this P does, right? I mean, this is trivially equivalent to saying P transpose A equals LU, right? <clears throat> so all the P is doing is permuting your equations. Now, when you are doing it on a computer, the P becomes critical <clears throat> not just for existence, but also for numerical stability, so you avoid these kind of numerical disasters, okay? <clears throat> so this, uh, the complexity of the LU decomposition will be roughly n cubed. In the dense case, it can be way faster if the A has some structure. For example, it is uh, sparse. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. So just to kind of remind you the factor solve approach. So when we use this LU decomposition, once you have computed the, the LU decomposition, and again, you wouldn't be coding it up yourselves, you would use an LU decomposition code that would return this P, L, and U for, for, for you. Then if, if, you, if you have that, then the solve you are doing is P, L, U, X equals B, and we do it exactly the same way. Let me kind of repeat it in this specific example. So you first solve for, uh, let's say some z1 such that pz1 equals b. Once you have the z1, then you solve for lz2 equals z1. And finally, you solve for ux equals z2, okay? So you do the sequence. The z1 you solve for trivially, right? The z1 is just the p transpose b. Here you do a forward substitution, here do backward substitution, and you get the x. Okay. Once you have gotten the x, it's kind of easy to figure out that pz1 is actually, here I have z1, by the way, is lz2, right? So this is plz2, where z2, by the way, is ux, okay? So this is plux, plu is a, ax, okay? So if this pz1 equals b, then you have a solution, then this x you computed in the last step is the solution you were looking for in the beginning. Okay, a specific, specific example of the factor solve approach. All right. So, um, very important case is sparse LU decomposition. Because almost always when we are in, in FIS base, uh, the matrix um, we need to solve against is sparse. And it's usually dramatically sparse. Usually it has something like 10, on the order of 10 non-zeros per row. So exploiting, exploiting the sparsity is, is necessary if you, wanna, if you want performance, okay? So there is a sparse version of LU decomposition, which is just a, a small modification of uh, the general LU decomposition. And it looks like this. You decompose A into P1. The LU is the same. And there is P2, where P1 and P2 are two different permutation matrices. So kind of one way you can look, into, look at this is by doing this, right? You can write this as P1 transposed A, P2 transpose equals LU. So you can see that the P1 transpose is essentially permuting the rows of A, while the P2 transpose is permuting the columns of A, okay? <clears throat> and why do I do this? Why do I do the second permutation there? There are two criteria. Uh, so the two criteria for choosing the P1 and P2, okay? The first one is the same as before, is to minimize uh, the effect of rounding errors. And the second one, and that's uh, specific to the sparse matrices, you want to maximize sparsity of the two factors, L and U, okay? Because if your matrix A is sparse, you get a sparse LU back but the sparsity can be uh, significantly worse than the sparsity of A, okay? And the sparsity of the L and U factors depends on the permutation P2 quite a lot. It also depends on the P1, okay? 
So you need to choose uh, these permutations carefully so you don't have too many non-zeros in your factors L and U. Okay? This is, this is sometimes called, you might sometimes hear the term fill-in. Fill-in means uh, non-zeros in A that became, uh, sorry, zeros in A that became non-zeros in the factors L and U. Okay? And, th and th there are some results, such as when, some theoretical results, such as when A is banded, the NLU also need to be banded, so the uh, non-zeros are restricted only to some narrow band. Uh, but usually you don't have to uh, worry about it. What you need to worry about is to make sure that whatever software you are using picks the right permutations, okay? Because, and this is kind of the message I would like you to remember, if you pick the wrong permutations, it might generate a crazy fill-in and you end up with lots of non-zeros in the LU factors, okay? <clears throat> and sometimes the software does a good job in uh, depicting these permutations is a bit, a bit of a black magic, okay? Finding the optimal permutations is an NP-complete problem, so there are, there are existing heuristics out there. I guess I'll talk more about it when we cover uh, Koleski decomposition. That's another type of decomposition. So let me maybe uh, mention that first, okay? So the LU decomposition is general. It works for also non-symmetric matrices, okay? Which sometimes you have to deal with. If you have a matrix which is N by N and it's symmetric and positive definite, That's what we talked about the last time. The positive definiteness is important in Newton's method. If you actually don't have a positive definite Hessian that you want to uh, modify it somehow, so you do have a positive definite Hessian. So this for fist base, this is a very important case. Okay. So in this case, what you do is a Koleski decomposition, which is sometimes also known as LLT, because as you can probably guess, you write the uh, a as L, L transposed, where L is a lower triangle. So obviously, if you can write it as LLT, it's going to be symmetric, right? Because if I transpose LLT, I just get LLT back, so it's clearly symmetric. It's also clearly uh, a positive uh, semi-definite, right? Because if I do, if I give you XTAX, that is XTLLTX, which is nothing but x, uh, should I write it? I don't like this, ltx transposed ltx, which is the square norm of ltx, which must be greater or equal than zero, okay? If on the diagonal of the lower triangle are positive values, then you actually have a positive definite factorization, okay? And that's 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 the default case of the Koleski. The, the statement is, I guess, the, uh, the, 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 the theorem is that if you have a symmetric and positive definite matrix, that then o there always exists a unique Koleski factorization LLT, okay? Where L, L is a lower triangle matrix. If you have only positive semi-definite matrix, then the theorem still holds, but you don't get a unique factorization. Okay, and uh, an interesting uh, oh, if you have indefinite matrix, then the Koleski factorization doesn't exist clearly, right? Because the LLT is always going to be positive semi-definite. If you have indefinite, you cannot possibly do the standard Koleski. You can do some modifications of it. Uh, another advantage of Koleski, so one advantage of Koleski over LU is that you only need one matrix, okay? You don't have to do L and U, you only have one. The other advantage is that you don't need any permutation, actually. So these stability issues <clears throat> that were so bad in the general case, they actually don't um, occur, or at least they are not that bad in, in the Koleski case, okay? So in, in theory, you don't need, I guess that's because of the positive definiteness assumption, you don't need the permutation there. In practice, people still do the permutation, but the permutation is mostly to uh, take advantage of sparsity, okay? But let's first take a quick look at, the, at a simple case. Let me give you an example of a, of a Koleski. Let's take a look at a simple dense case. Let's do a two by two matrix when I have, just to, just to give you an idea how the Koleski decomposition works. It's actually pretty simple. So I have a symmetric matrix. So I write A12, A12 on, on both sides. Let's see how much time do I have. 
<clears throat> things are good. We're good. And I want to factor. So this is a symmetric matrix, and I want to factorize it into a lower, lower, lower triangle L12, L22, and its transposition. Okay, so that's the same matrix transpose. So it looks like this: zero L22. Okay. So then how does the algorithm work? So the first thing you can see is that A11 must be exactly L11 squared, just simply from matrix multiplication, right? So from this you can immediately compute what is L11, right? L11 is the square root of A11. What if A11 is negative? then your matrix was not positive definite to begin with. If there is any negative number on the diagonal, you immediately know the matrix is not positive uh, definite. Why? Because you can take, so if, it, if there is a non-zero at element i, then you can do ei, that's the standard basis vector, zeros everywhere, uh, one at the position of i. And if you do this, and the, and the a i so that this this return this gives you a i i if that happened to be negative you immediately have a proof that it's not a positive definite matrix okay so one that and that, that's something that's very easy to look at okay testing for positive definite actually is not easy but it's easy to look at the diagonal and see if there is something something negative in that case you can immediately hey the, are you kidding this is not positive definite okay it can be that there are all positive numbers on the diagonal and it's still not positive definite. Okay, that's why the positive definiteness is a little bit tricky. But th this, this, this case is easy and uh, usually uh, the Koleski codes check, check, for, check for that immediately. All right, so, uh, so let's assume that this AA was good, that it was positive, so we, so we can proceed with the Koleski algorithm, okay? So then the next thing uh, we do, we let's let's figure out what is a one two. Okay, so what what is this one? So that's just uh, this, right? So that's just l one one times l one two equals a one two. Okay, I already know what l one one. I already know what l one one is, right? I just computed that, so I can compute l one two simply as a one two divided by l one one. Okay. And once I'm there, I can do this. I can say that L12 squared plus L22 squared equals A22. Okay. So I already have uh, L, L12. That, that's, that's what it was. So from this, I can compute that L22 is going to be the square root of A22 minus L12 squared. Okay. Or A, A, uh, L12, that's, that's what I computed just, just before. Okay. Again. If this happened to be a negative number, it's not a positive definite matrix, okay? And by the way, this is the best way how you can test for positive definiteness, okay? Because the Koleski algorithm uh, can uh, easily exploit sparsity, okay? So if you have a sparse matrix and you want to test whether it's positive definite or not, the best way is to just run Kowalski. If it succeeds, you know it was positive definite. If it fails, if at some point it would have to take a square root of a negative number, then it throws an error and, and you know immediately it's not positive definite. Okay, that's, and that's the best, that's much better way than computing the eigenvalues because that gets complicated for sp and gets slower for sparse matrices. Uh, so the Kowalski is a better uh, way. Yep. Didn't you say it could succeed even if it's semi-definite? So it could possibly. Yes, but it will tell you. Uh, you're right. Uh, if it's semi-definite, then this would be you. You would get a zero there. So so it would still, still tell it could you still you tell you that. Or actually, you would pro you'll probably see this because on the diagonal of your L, you would get some zeros. Okay. And probably it's a similar case. If you get something close to zero, then there's something funny going on. And you probably want to do some regularization. Yeah, that's a good question. So if you are running this on sparse matrices, uh, then what you want to do is uh, the permutation again. So then, then what you are actually doing is this P L L T P transpose. So here the permutation matrix is the same because the matrix was symmetric. Again, it's kind of uh, Again, it corresponds to permuting the rows and columns of the A matrix. And 
basically because this is a symmetric matrix, if you imagine the matrix was generated from some mesh, okay, that you have some vertices going from one to n, and then in the matrix you record zero or one, whether the two vertices are connected by a, an edge, like a mass frame system, okay? Then this PTAP, all it does, it basically just renumbers your vertices, okay? Because it kind of doesn't matter which vertex is number 117 and which vertex is number 531, right? Because you can number them, whatever. And this, this corresponds exactly to permuting the rows and columns, okay? So this changes nothing in the result, or more accurately, the result also just gets permuted. But it, the way why this is very important is because, again, because of the fill-in, okay? If your A is sparse and you want to be performant, the only reason when you would not want to be performant if the matrix is small, okay? If it's like 10 by 10 or 100 by 100, then you, you might just say screw it and use the dense, dense matrix algebra, okay? Because if you are cubing it, if your complexity is cubed in the, in the dense algebra and, and the, the base is like 10, then you don't care. 10 to cube is fine, okay? If your matrix is 10,000 by 10,000, then you cannot afford the dense algebra and the sparse is actually the only way to go. That's the only way to make it run at all in, in, the, in that case, okay? And in that case, it becomes really important to pick the right permutation so this L doesn't have too much of a fill-in. The L will always get less sparse than A, okay? In our experience, like the, in the, like the typical, typical matrices that come up in FISBASED, uh, it's typically on the order of 10, okay? So the L has typically 10 times more non-zeros than A. If it's, and it can get significantly worse, okay? If the permutation is not chosen well, then the L can have a terrible fill-in, okay? It, in, in the worst case, it could even make the entire L dense, in which case you will probably not find out because your algorithm will like run out of memory, like will try to allocate some virtual memory and possibly crash your computer. That's one way of saying that you did not find a good permutation P, okay? So, and there are um, multiple heuristics for finding a good P. You might have, you might see if you look into the documentation of the code, there's things like AMD, approximate minimal degree, or nested dissection. Those are all heuristics for picking a good permutation P, okay? And they usually work quite well. Uh, but if, if it's not working, you might as well try a different heuristic, okay? And if it's really not working, you're getting really bad fill-in, then you might need to think about the structure of your matrix and kind of help the solver uh, a little bit. So, as I was saying, uh, you will always be using an existing solver unless you want to do your PhD in exactly this. There are entire groups who uh, focus their research on exactly this. That's also why you want to be using their, their, their solvers because they are uh, really good. And the solvers only work, uh, always work uh, in a sequence of steps, okay? So the first step they do, if you, give, if you give it a matrix A and a task solve AX equals B, so the first step it does is, is reordering, okay? That's just a term for finding this permutation P, okay? Find Find P to minimize fill-in. That's the first thing you need to do is to figure out what the permutation of your rows and columns or of your vertices, if that's what your rows and columns correspond to, will be, okay? Now the interesting thing is that this reordering does not need to know the actual values in the A matrix, okay? And actually also the second uh, a phase uh, does not need to know that either. The second phase is called symbolic factorization. And in this phase, the solver figures out the sparsity structure of L. Okay, so in both of these uh, phases of the solver, we don't need to know the actual values, okay? Uh, this only works with the sparsity structure. meaning not actual values, okay? Then, then comes step number three, and that's the numeric factorization. 
and that's when the actual values in A come in, okay? And that's when the solver does exactly this, actually, computes these Ls if it's a Koleski solver, okay? The L LU, by the way, follows exactly the same pattern, okay? Uh, and finally, 4 is the, is the solve thing, so that's the last step, that's this factor solve uh, thing, so that's, that's the solve. That's typically the sequence of backward-forward substitutions, probably some permutations. Okay, so this is important to know because if, um, uh, if you have a different A matrix, but it has the same sparsity pattern, okay, it means that the non-zeros are, the potential non-zeros are on the same locations, okay? So meaning, so the sparsity structure means that I tell you what I, J, or, let me write it like this, which of the elements can potentially be non-zero? Okay, but that, that doesn't mean they have to be non-zero, okay? You are always free to put their zero. Zero is a perfectly valid value, okay? Whenever you are working with sparse matrices, you're only telling where must be zeros, okay? Zeros can also be elsewhere, but uh, that, that doesn't matter. You only tell where you guarantee there will be zeros, okay? There is even a, a like, a un, uh, understood or well-established contract in these solvers where you don't take advantage of like a fortuitous cancellation. Like for example, if, I, if I'm doing computations like this, if I have number, I don't know, 5.178, I just made it up, and I subtract it and it happens to be exactly the same thing, one, one minus 1578, that actually is zero. So actually that happens to be zero. These solvers don't take advantage of it, that this actually happened to be zero, okay? They only, the sparsity structure only means when you know ahead of time there must be zero, okay? And that's what I mean by the, the sparsity structure. So these first two phases of the solver, they don't need to know the actual values in the A matrix, okay? So if you are in a situation when you know the sparsity structure of the A matrix, which you usually know, if you are doing a phase-based simulation and your matrix is given by a mass spring system, then the sparsity structure is determined by what nodes or what vertices are connected by springs that determines the sparsity structure, okay? And this usually does not change. Your system may move, your mass spring system cloth or whatever you are simulating, that can, that can be going like crazy, but the sparsity structure will not be changing unless you are doing something like cutting, or like in surgery simulation, if you are removing or adding edges. Now the numeric factorization, um, and by the way, the symbolic factorization and the reorder, the reordering is usually fast. The symbolic factorization can be slow, so if you can pre-compute it, it's usually an advantage. Okay, if you are in exactly the situation when you have the same sparse structure, but a different specific values will be coming in, you can pre-compute these first two guys, the reordering and the symbolic factorization, and then just redo the numeric factorization. If you are so lucky, which Sometimes you actually are, that's the whole idea of projective dynamics and these faster physics solvers. If you are so lucky that even the matrix A itself will not be changing at all, even the values will stay the same. Kind of like I was saying in this example here, okay, when I have exactly the same matrix, so the same sparsity pattern of course, but also the same exact values, then you can pre-compute even the numeric factorization, okay? So then your pre-computation goes all, all the way up to here. Then you're pre-computing every, everything except for the final solve step, okay? And the final solve step is usually fast and you can also quickly repeat it for, for different right-hand sides if you, if you have all, all this stuff pre-computed. By the way, when you run a, a modern solver, Eigen has uh, solvers in it. One solver that's particularly good is a Par Pardisa solver. It's not free but even but it's free for um, academic purposes that's what we had good experience with it, it does exactly these steps and it can even tell you in the debugging regime it can tell you how long each of the steps took it will tell you what what is the fill-in in your matrices so that's useful for debugging because if it's taking longer than you would want then you can start looking into these steps and seeing what went wrong or if there is some opportunity to pre-compute something like pre-compute the symbolic factorization and one last thing I would like to mention, how does it connect to what we talked about the last time, the definiteness fixes and Newton's method, okay? What we talked about the last time is that you, uh, if your Hessian, if your Hessian, 
your Hessian, by the way, that's that's what usually is this A matrix, okay? Maybe plus some mass matrix, but that doesn't really uh, change uh, almost anything. So if your Hessian is indefinite, then you need to do definiteness fix, which means that you replace it with a matrix which is C times identity, where C is some scalar greater than zero. Okay, that's what we talked about last time. And you need to figure out how large the C should be so that this thing is positive definite. And you and it will and, and then consequently Newton will give you correct descent direction as opposed to an ascent direction, which could happen if the Hessian was indefinite and you didn't do this definiteness phase. So the way you can do this with an existing solver is by running the Kolaski because you know that the Hessian is symmetric, right? So in, in this case, you uh, immediately use Kolaski because it's better than LU decomposition. And if it is not positive definite, then Kolesky, the, the Kolaski routines will be happy to tell you, okay? They will tell you an error. In which case you go back and you say, oh, my C was too low, I need to increase the C. Typically multiply by 10 or, or something like this. You can have a, some smart, you can try to do some smarter heuristic which would then go to something like trust region methods, but it but it's a little bit more complicated. This is what we implemented before. It's not the most clever strategy, but it works. And you, you eventually get to high enough C so that Koleski succeeds. You get the decomposition, you 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 compute, you you solve the system of linear equations, you get a descent direction, and you can happily proceed. And this this works quite well. There is also a different way you can go about this definiteness fix. There are modified Koleski routines. I'm actually not sure if they are implemented in Eigen. I tried looking, but they didn't find anything, so they might not be. That's a little bit advanced. That basically means that this algorithm itself will modify the Koleski factors. So in case you are giving it an indefinite matrix, it will not give you a Koleski decomposition because it wouldn't, wouldn't exist. It will give you a perturbed, a modified Koleski decomposition, which tries to approximate this indefinite matrix as close as possible. Okay. I do not know if this is implemented in some existing software. I know the algorithms exist, they have been published. If there are past implementations that's yet to be discovered. So far we were implementing it this way just by increasing the C and that, that worked fine. There are, by the way, uh, also uh, different ways to do the definiteness fixes, like more advanced definiteness fixes. Projective dynamics is one of them. So in that case, you don't have to worry too much about this, even though about this basic like Tikhonov uh, definiteness fix, even though it's still good to know about it because that's kind of like the, that's like a sledgehammer for definiteness fix. It's just adding the C times identity. And there are some more refined tricks, which we'll, do, which we'll talk about when we talk about finite element methods and projective dynamics. That will be the last part we will cover. The next time I will talk about iterative solvers. That's the different way, a different school of thought for solving exactly the same problem, uh, which has different properties. And sometimes you want to use direct solvers, sometimes you want to use iterative solvers, and sometimes you want to use some combination of both. So it's definitely good to know about both of these approaches. All right, so that's about it. Any questions? So that was iterative solvers. This survived, so that's good. Thanks.